Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out uh, to this, this session. This is the last session today in the, in the research track uh, here at the summit. I've been here all day, so in case any of you have been in the room with me all day, uh, I'm sorry, to, I'm going to introduce myself again, but my name is Jed Sundwall, and I run the Open Data Program at Amazon Web Services, and uh, I get to work with a lot of organizations, a lot of government agencies, a lot of research institutions that, that work with really, really large volumes of data in the cloud and share share data collaboratively, collaboratively in, the cl in the cloud. Uh, I'm very excited today that we have uh, Ralph Perico and Mike Gardinelli from PNNL to come talk about how they use AWS to foster large-scale collaboration uh, and, and research on the cloud. So there's a quote that I really love that describes the value of AWS really concisely. This is a quote from Andy Jassy, who's the CEO of AWS, uh, where he says, invention requires two things the ability to try a lot of experiments and not having to live with collateral damage of failed experiments. And it's, it's a really wonderful quote that he often gives when he's talking about how the cloud has enabled a lot of startups to try very audacious things without a lot of risk because they're able to try something crazy and new without buying a ton of hardware and infrastructure. Uh, but of course, any scientist understands that science is all about trying, you know, running lots and lots of experiments. Now, if you have to run a lot of experiments and you have to buy computing resources every time you try to do that, it can become really expensive and cost prohibitive to try things and to ask questions that might be expensive to ask. Uh, so what's really exciting as organizations like PNNL start using AWS is that they're finding they're able to run much larger experiments much more cheaply which much, with much less risk and then also do that collaboratively. And Ralph and Michael have great experience in this and so I'm very happy to welcome to the stage this afternoon. Thank you. Come on up. Uh, is that the clicker? I can just use the space bar. Click All right, so thanks, Jed. Um, and, and thanks, everybody, for coming today. So uh, my name is Mike Gardinelli. I'm a software engineer at PNNL, and, and so is Ralph. Uh, we both have been at the lab for about seven years now. We both joined the lab about the same time. And we lead a bunch of development efforts, uh, drive capabilities, and try to push for the adoption of new and emerging technologies, all in the support of the government missions and problems that we support. And it's a constantly evolving environment, as Jed alluded to. And we are now really trying to push for other opportunities and cases where we can drive better collaboration among the researchers that we work with, and then the research and engineer collaborations, and then find other ways for folks to collaborate even outside of PNL directly. And that's what AWS is absolutely helping us do. And that's what we're going to talk about today, uh, is how it has really pushed the envelope for the lab in that way along with just the use of specific tools and the standardization of tools uh, and, and giving people a reason to do it. And because that's oftentimes, at least in the space where we work, something that's really difficult is not just new things, but the adoption of them. And when Ralph and I were first pushing for this in some of the solutions and things that we were building, we were getting a lot of just uncertainty and, and reservations about us doing it, simply a lot of times just because people didn't know and didn't understand it. Uh, instead of in some of the cases, instead of just asking for permission and waiting for some of that, we kind of just pushed it forward uh, fairly aggressively just to kind of see what kind of feedback we'd get both from the, solution, the solutions and things that we were building and then also the people that were involved. And it, it's actually been fairly positive for the most part. So we're going to just briefly go over PNNL in general in the lab environment just to give people an idea of who we are. That happens a lot. We say PNNL and people say who, and then we say where, and they, they don't know where it's at and all that kind of stuff. And then Ralph's going to talk a little bit about software engineering in general at PNNL, go through just like a basic uh, data flow. Uh, and the intent with that is just to kind of show a lot of what our researchers go through to do some of the work they have. And even though it seems painless, a lot of times it can take a lot of time and effort just to stand something basing up so they can do their work. Uh, and then we're going to go through an actual use case or example of how we've brought all these things together, the improved collaboration, the standardization of the tools, and then the use of the AWS, AWS environment that's really improved our access to resources and reduced the time it takes to get them. And then we'll do a quick wrap up and, and open it up for a few questions. So the la this is just a bit about the lab system. So PNL is one of 17 DOE labs uh, in the DOE complex. It's been around for about 60 years. And the primary reason that they, that they had the lab or they brought the labs in was they, they have a need to drive large-scale, long-term R&D efforts that is typically beyond the scope of academia and, and private industry. And then the other part of it is that one of the other primary reasons that, that they were created was 
they wanted to find a way that these labs could complement the roles and capabilities, again, of academia and industry. And then a lot of the research that gets done at the labs is, requires specific or certain facilities, specific or unique instrumentation that is just outside the bounds of, of academia and then beyond, or typically beyond, the risk tolerance for uh, corporate research labs. So then just a, a brief bit about PNL specifically. So we're located in Richland, Washington. That's when I ever, whenever I say where people are, or we say Richland, they're like where. Um, so anyways, Eastern Washington, we have offices in other locations. So Seattle, Squim, Portland. We have folks in the DC area and then other various remote locations. Uh, and then these were just stats from 2016. So we had about a billion dollars in R&D expenditures, which is what funds our research. Uh, and then from that, we had a little over 1,000 publications, a little over 100 public, uh, patents, and then and some various other awards. And then just a few key inventions to note is that uh, PNL pioneered a few, few technologies. So they, they were at the forefront of the technology that led to CDs and DVDs, uh, and then also the technology that is uh, the millimeter wave that's deployed at airports, the scanner where you got to put your hands up and all that. Um, we're not big fans of it, but we at least are proud that we made it. <laughs> And so the, the lab has three core capabilities that it focuses on, uh, data analytics, chemistry, and environmental science. And these core capabilities are really directed at trying to provide innovation and improvements towards national security, <coughs> power grid, climate, and environmental remediation. And so with that, Ralph's going to now step in and talk a bit about software engineering, uh, let's go over some of these basic data flows and the data tooling that's part of these solutions. Thanks, Mike. As Mike said, we're software engineers at PNNL, and um, the, the purpose of this talk is to really talk about collaboration with researchers. We're, we, that's what we do, is we help enable the researchers by working with them. And by researchers in this context, we're, we're talking about data, right? And so uh, this could be the data from a physical science experiment, but more often than not, well, that, that could be where the data comes from, but then we're working with uh, data scientists and analysts and whatnot to, to get the data through the system and made, make it available for them to do what it is what they want to do. Uh, software engineering at the lab, largely, we, we try to be really agile um, and very iterative in our approaches and uh, taking a fail-fast method. So we have you know, two-week sprints, gives us opportunities to try new things. Um, and then if, if it works great, fantastic, let's move forward with that approach. Otherwise, let's throw that away and let's move on and, and try the next thing. And AWS has been really critical in helping with that. Um, like I'm sure some folks in this room, uh, we have often limited resources, both hardware and people, right? So first of all, even if you have, you know, if you, even if you have a budget for hardware, uh, actually procuring it, finding space for it, making sure you have the right power, cooling, whatnot, rack space, uh, that can be an effort, and that can take weeks, if not months, to get your 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 uh, hardware stood up. And that that we just we want to move faster than that, right? And that's where AWS has just been a real game changer for us, and has helped us to focus on the on the mission. So talking about collaboration today and uh, working with researchers, so the problem is the opposite of collaboration is isolated research. And so in this context, we're talking about, you know, at the lab, researchers will get funds uh, from, a, from a, what we call a sponsor, and that corresponds to a government agency uh, that's contracted us, that is working with us to do some piece of work with them. And they, uh, if they're not plugged in with, um, with uh, engineering for whatever reason, uh, within the appropriate, at the, at, when they are starting their work, they'll just start working independently, which you, you can't blame them, of course. Um, and you know, they'll, they'll use whatever resources they have available to them, laptops, you know, whatever uh, project, the servers from another project. Um, they'll work on their algorithms or whatever it is that they're, they're wanting to, uh, to, to do. They'll, they'll uh, demo it to a sponsor. And sure enough, the sponsor loves it. And then they approach um, engineering and they say, hey, I need to deploy this. Oh, by the way, I need to scale it up and uh, we need to harden it and we need it in a month. And by that time, you know, engineering, we're, you know, we're often caught, you know, we're not up to speed on what it is they're trying to do. Uh, and, and, and while we can help them, it'd be much more efficient and helpful if we can uh, work with them earlier in the process. And so that's largely what we um, uh, are discussing today is that collaboration between the researchers and the, and the engineers and how it allows us to um, work together to create a, a better solution ultimately for our sponsors. Um, the focus on here, of course, is AWS and how uh, we're able to collaborate through that. You know, research is the lifeblood of the lab, um, but AWS has really helped remove a lot of the barriers, at least in our 
our division where we um, are, we have influence and are working together. Uh, it's provided you know better capabilities, new capabilities, better products. What kind of products do we you know put out? It, it depends. You know, on the research effort, it could be uh, simply a paper, uh, some new algorithms or concepts, or a, a, a deployable solution. So with that, we've you know, come up with this notion of data flows, right? And data flows aren't anything unique. And in fact, you've probably seen a diagram similar to this sometime in the last two days, talking about we're bringing data in, right? And it, who knows what the data is? We gotta do something with it. We gotta process it, go through ETL, which, uh, extract, transform, load, phases, uh, rich the data. And we have to store the data and, and share the data. And this is all use case driven. And you'll hear us say that a lot. You know, it's, it depends on the use case. What is the use case? Because that depends on what we do with the data. Typically, if we try to do anything, try to pre-optimize any of our data pipeline, it ends up, uh, uh, we have to undo that and, you know, either it doesn't get used or we, do, we have to redo it. So, so we've kind of converged on this notion of a data flow toolbox. Clearly, Mike and I, neither of us work in marketing, and that's the best name we could come up with, data flow toolbox. So uh, you know, here we got our ingest and processing, data delivery and storage. Um, we're big fans, uh, starting from the left on the ingest and processing of Apache NiFi. We've really converged on that technology for our ETL. If you're not familiar with it, I really encourage you to go out and check it out. Um, uh, pretty much anywhere in our system that data is going in or out, there's going to be a NiFi there, and its ability to scale out is, is really remarkable. Uh, for delivery, uh, it's very, uh, again, it's use case driven. Uh, the tools we lean on the most are going to be uh, Apache Kafka, S3, and SQS. Um, you know, we used to do everything in Kafka, and, uh, and, that, and that, worked, that worked well. Um, but then as we started working with more researchers and, and talking to folks, uh, it was this, you know, the idea of really, do you, do you really need streaming data, right? And is this something that we could put in S3 instead? And so, so now, more times than not, we do try to push people to S3 for a delivery mechanism, uh, and then um, SQS as well. We've been more and more leaning on uh, Amazon uh, Web Services and, and the building capabilities. Then, of course, storage, right? What is, and again, I said it already, what is the use case, you know? Uh, so if a, if a researcher comes in and they have uh, data that they, they need brought into the system, it's not un uncommon for them not even to know what they want to do with the data yet. So we just need to park it somewhere, but we know we want to start gathering and accumulating it. So we'll just put it in Amazon S3. We also use Elasticsearch quite a bit uh, for uh, search capability and some analytics. Uh, DynamoDB and Cassandra uh, for NoSQL-based systems. Um, and then Hadoop, we have uh, internally a lot of data comes in, into the network where we have Hadoop infrastructure. We run Spark, you know, Python, uh, MapReduce, Jobs, Hive and whatnot. Uh, the technologies that are in the small print though, there, those are technologies that we have used in the past, but um, don't, uh, we're not you know, kind of currently part of our, our primary toolbox there. Um, in addition to that, sorry, uh, there's, there's other technologies on here that we're, we're not showing. Um, we, we still use relational databases. You know, we're, we use RDS on AWS with uh, Postgres. Uh, that works pretty well for us. And then uh, we Kibana quite a bit with uh, Elasticsearch and a myriad of other tools. And this isn't to be you know, like, hey, you only can use these tools. That's not at all what this is. These are the tools that we've been using, that we've converged on, that have been really helpful for us to create these. This idea of these um, uh, reusable data flows, for example. So by cobbling these tools together in various combinations, we're able to really you know, get data, transform it, do enrichments on it, do really uh, some real analysis on that data, and then provide it to the researchers to do what it is that they want to do. And, and oftentimes, that, you know, that, that, trans, that uh, ETL, that uh, extraction transfer load phase, will do some analysis even in there for the researchers. So by the time they get it, it's been uh, kind of pre-populated with what they're looking for. So uh, let's see, with that said, uh, Mike's going to come back, and he's going to walk through an actual use case of, of how we work with data and, and what a data flow uh, will look like in using the tools we just uh, talked about. So, Mike. Thanks. So, as Ralph said, we, we actually want to go through a real-life example, a real-life use case where we brought all these pieces together. So, where we were trying to improve the collaboration amongst the researchers and engineers, uh, how we tried to at least enforce a little bit of standardization on the tools and components, platforms that are used, uh, and then just highlight or show the power of the AWS environment in our ability to make this happen. Uh, and so with, this, with this, this primary reason for this use case is that our researchers want to establish an environment or a pipeline 
where images could be brought in and they could attach classifiers to them so that they could actually physically classify images. Uh, and some of the challenges that if we would have done this in our, in our PNL or our physical environment, we would have ran into all kinds of problems. So we would have had limitations with the hardware. It would have probably been difficult to scale it out. It probably would have been difficult for us to make sure that others had access to it. Uh, and then even just some of the more basic things, like just some of the trying to figure out what technical components would make sense and all that could be difficult. And so we came into this with two, two primary goals. So we had engineering goals and then the researchers had goals. Uh, so the ones that you see here are the engineering goals and I'll, and I'll get to the research ones. So for the engineering side, we really wanted to establish this pipeline where researchers could hand us references to images. And when they did that, the pipeline would go and retrieve the images, strip out some metadata, and then store them so that they could be used at a different part in the process. And then we also needed to make sure that as images were brought in, whether they were brought in or, or retrieved or they were just landed somewhere, that the, the addition of these images would create notifications so that the researchers and their processes could be notified of those new images and then they could take them through their classification process. And then just like the images themselves, any metadata that gets generated, so the actual classifications of the images or the labeling that occurred, we want to make sure that both the reference to the original image and any classification data that got gathered was stored in a way that could be easily retrieved, analyzed, and reviewed, Bo both for just demonstration purposes and also for effectiveness and things like that. And then lastly, at least for the engineers, is we want to make sure that it was a collaborative environment, meaning other engineers could jump in and see what was done so we could maybe reuse certain components. Other researchers could jump in and actually use the data or reference the data or look at just the outcomes of the classifications. And then from the research side, they all, of course had very similar needs, but they also wanted to make sure that it was extensible, but not necessarily extensible in terms of scalability, they, which was one of them, but they, they wanted to make sure that they could easily drop in other models, so classification models, or even just different classifiers so that they could see or compare things in the way that things are being classified and see how effective they were. They, of course, did care about the scalability, given that there could be an unknown set of images or references that they wanted to hand off. Uh, so oftentimes in the research space, we'll get a collection of data, whether that be just a handoff from uh, one of our sponsors or even just internal source stuff. And they wanted to be able to retrain and or handle uh, the addition of new images. Uh, and then lastly, just like the engineering side, they wanted to make sure it was collaborative, where it was easy for other researchers to come in, get access to the images, and get access to the classification data. So this image is a, is a depiction of the actual pipeline that was built. And what you can see is a mix of things. So there is an actual mix of AWS services and technical components that was used to construct this pipeline. And we'll actually walk through each one of the technical components and, and why we chose those, at least as part of this initial solution. Uh, but before we get to that, we did want to highlight, because we've been talking about it a lot, we wanted to highlight how the collaboration happened and where, where the two groups physically sat in this process. So the engineering side is on the left. Uh, and the primary goals were reflected in what I just mentioned, but the engineers built the systems, the processing, and then the delivery of the images, and they used the components or built the components in a way that could be scalable and then also meet the needs of the environment. And then on the right side, the researchers wanted to, of course, be notified of those new images so that they could attach their classifiers. And in this case, it's a TensorFlow serving classifier that they, they built and packaged so that all the images, once they came in, could be passed through there, they could classify them, and the results could be, sto or the results could be stored. And then we made sure that they, of course, met in the middle, where the notifications, the physical images, and the metadata from those classifications could coexist so that people could come in at different points in the solution or in the pipeline and do various things with it. So the, the first component in the pipeline is Apache NiFi. And, it, and as Ralph mentioned, it is usually or typically now one of the primary starting points of any data process that we build. Uh, now, that's not to say that we won't change that at some point, but right now it, it is used quite heavily. And we went through a lot of evolutions to get to the point where, where we standardized on NiFi. So we built proprietary frameworks uh, within the lab, and those were... Those, those worked well, but then they would get outdated or they wouldn't be maintained. We used uh, ActiveMQ and Storm for various pipelines that were similar to this, but they had their own complexities and challenge, challenges. Uh, but once we adopted NiFi and started using it, it really did make a huge difference for us. 
So a little bit about NIFI. So NIFI was created by the NSA about 10 years ago. So it's definitely been battle tested. Uh, it was open sourced a couple years ago and is now an Apache project. Uh, and it really is just phenomenal for things like data routing, ETL, delivery, all those things. And it's really painless from multiple aspects. So not only is it really easy to install, configure, and scale, uh, but it's also very easy to use, meaning like to just build out pipelines and, and manipulate pipelines. And this is, we get this kind of feedback from all kinds of different groups, not just our engineers and researchers, but this also comes from our testers, uh, even some analysts, uh, and even some, some other folks like outside of some of those groups that have used it just to template flows. Um, so just quickly walking down some of these features, because th there's a lot more than what we listed here, but these are the ones that we find of value, and some of these are repeated. So the data routing is extremely robust. The ETL is, is awesome. I touched on the installation and the barrier of entry, but there's a couple other things that are really nice about NIFI, and one of them is the visual aspect. So you can physically see in operation or in process how much data is flowing through your pipelines. You can see when you have hangups or bottlenecks, so you can physically see where things are being held up by some process or some dependency that's in the flow. Uh, and there's all these metrics that you can visibly, visually see, visually see. And then the back pressure in queuing is also phenomenal. So we have, uh, at least in our physical environments, we don't run into this as much, not, or not nearly as much in the AWS space, but we would oftentimes run into cases where downstream repositories, so like our Elasticsearch clusters or our Postgres clusters or whatever, were down or unavailable or they were being pa patched or bounced. And when, once we dropped in NIFI, we didn't have to worry about it anymore. We would just let the back pressure and queuing handle it. And once they became available again, stuff would just start flowing. It's, it's really been a game changer for us in terms of both complexity in the pipelines we build and then the resiliency that it has to unknown conditions or even known conditions, again, like, like patching systems. So, this is a visual of the initial part of the flow or the pipeline that, that we just described. And what you see is, is a few things. So you see three processors or what are called processors. And those are the consume Kafka, the image cache filter, and the put SNS. Now the, ca the consume Kafka and put SNS are out of the box processors. So NIFI comes with a ton of processors that you can drop right into your flows that are out of the box. Um, and you can connect to all kinds of data repositories, message queues, file systems, and then a bunch of AWS services. It's why it works really well in AWS, because you can easily attach it to SQS, S3, all kinds of things. And then the image cache filter is a custom processor that we wrote. Uh, and this was something that we've kind of gone back and forth on when we build out these flows and kind of converged on that we will oftentimes build custom processors because we don't want to overly complex or overly complicate or bloat the flows. Uh, and so we'll just custom write something to do something specific. Uh, so some, some of what we found is if you, if you drop too many processors in a flow, it'll overwhelm the resources and things and your concurrency and some of those other things won't work well. So that one's custom. And then the other things you see are the connectors. And the connectors are what actually are, of course, the routing, but they're also the backing queues. So if a processor, start, a processor starts to get behind or you stop it or pause it, things will just start to back up on your queues. There are also logic points to where you can, of course, derive things that happen on failure or success, but you can also write custom logic so that you can reroute things based on various criteria that you identify in the flow. It's, it's extremely powerful. And then, of course, as you can see, the visual aspect is really nice. Now, one thing I want to highlight as a both a benefit and a danger is that in operation, in something running, you can physically reroute on the fly. You can easily grab onto or attach to an operating processor and redirect the data. You can also inspect the data that's going through. Now, the danger there is that we've had, and Ralph and I have had this happen a couple times, where one of our engineers just wanted to check something out, and when they did that, they inadvertently broke the flow. So we had to apply some other restrictions once we found that that was kind of becoming a problem. And so this is, this is just a really basic example of that part of the flow where the data that we're pulling off the queue is images or references to images that the, the researchers wanted us to process. Uh, and then it hits the actual filter, the image cache filter processor, and they're applying specific criteria, in this case, a koala image that they want to extract from the stream and then pass it down to the SNS notification, which is what's notifying the other processing points, Lambda in this case, that's, that work needs to happen. 
And so what we did is, of course, we're extracting the data from Kafka, we're filtering the data with our custom processor, and then we're writing a custom SNS payload that then is the, the starting point for the Lambda expression. Uh, and so just a quick visual back on the actual pipeline itself. So NiFi was the ingest point. We built the SNS P, or the SNL uh, payload, and then we pass it to Lambda. And then this is just a, a full example of what the SNS payload looks like. The blue, of course, being the piece that we constructed in our NiFi processor. Uh, so with that, Ralph's going to actually continue the, the discussion and the breakdown of the work that was done all through the rest of the components. So, thanks, Ralph. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, so j just to review where we're at, the, you know, the point of this is to show how we're enabling research, how we're enabling collaboration. And so we're walking through this flow where the goal is there's JSON data coming in, there's references to images in that JSON. We want to be able to pull out those references, actually download the images, and provide them to the researchers so they can do, what, do the work they want to do on that. Um, Lambda is, uh, you know, it's an event-driven serverless computing platform, and it's a, it's a really powerful to, uh, way to scale out um, functions called on demand. Uh, we're going to dive a little bit more into this and also talk about uh, why we chose the components we did and uh, sort of our, our path, I guess, to adopting um, more and more AWS services. Uh, just going through this flow a little bit, so as Mike, Mike talked about the Amazon SNS uh, portion, we get the message off uh, the, the process notification. First thing we do is we check Dynamo to see if that, that uh, record, that image had been uh, seen before. If not, we go ahead and download that image from the internet and then we uh, convert it to JPEG and strip out all the EXIF data. From there, the metadata is written back to Dynamo, is written to Dynamo. Uh, we use SQS to notify, uh, who are, in this case, the researchers that there's a new image available and the, then the um, image is written to an S3 bucket. So, why we chose these components, SNS was really pr pretty functional. Um, only certain services will trigger an AWS Lambda call, and in this case, uh, uh, SNS was uh, the, the one we chose to use. Um, and NiFi has built-in uh, AWS SNS capabilities, so that worked easily enough. The Amazon DynamoDB, we wanted a NoSQL solution uh, for that uh, because the data, we're just hashing the URL and we're just doing lookups on the, on the metadata. We're not actually enabling any kind of search capability, so we didn't need like a relational database, for example, in this case. And we were going for like a pure AWS solution here, right? So that's, you'll, you'll notice that about this as well, this particular piece. S SQS to notify and then uh, Amazon S3 to store the images, of course. Um, SQS, you may, if you're familiar with S3 and SQS, you may be thinking, well, why didn't you just notify off the S3 bucket? And that, that is an option. We could have done that, and we do that elsewhere. But in this case, uh, there was a specific condition where that wasn't going to work as well. And so um, we just, it was easier for us to manually just handle the notifications there. Um, now, why Lambda? So a little bit more about that. So we know it's a great service. And this is kind of getting a little bit into our adoption uh, into more and more cloud features, um, this was a big step for us when, uh, you know, we started dipping our toe into the, into the cloud. We, like a lot of folks, were, you know, we're concerned about two things primarily, cost and then vendor lock-in, right? And so um, what, you know, are, are we just going to lose all our money and are we going to write a bunch of code that's only going to run on AWS and therefore all this work that we've done is not going to be portable? Um, and so... Uh, as far, and Lambda was a big step in that direction um, as far as us trying this uh, method out. Um, we started, like a lot of folks, we started with infrastructure of a service. We just kind of did the, I heard someone refer to it as the, the, the forklift model, right, where we basically just forklifted our infrastructure off-prem and just dropped it into uh, AWS, and uh, that, that's how we started, and it, it worked fine. We spun up EC2 instances, uh, used IAM, um, S3, you know, but we purposely stayed away from any AWS specific services because we didn't want to get locked in, right? And now that we've been out there for several years and we've been using these services more and more, we know uh, some of those fears are unfounded, really, quite honestly. And um, especially the, the, a little bit on the vendor lock-in part. So this is where the combination of Apache NiFi and AWS has been really powerful because, it, because Apache NiFi comes with all this great AWS integration built in, for us to write to SQS versus writing to Kafka or some other messaging system or to um, read from a relational database or write data to HDFS, it's all, it's pretty baked in and it's really pretty easy just as Mike talked about, just you can, 
you know, let's say your, Kaf your Kafka cluster went down, you can point it, you can drag your arrow to an S3 bucket and say, you know what, just drop it all in S3 until we figure this out if you want to do something like that. Uh, to to uh, uh, another question maybe about why we chose Lambda. So we, we love NiFi, and Mike gave a good introduction to that. And we actually did this in NiFi first. We took all that logic that was in the, in the center there, and we wrote a processor, and uh, we deployed it in Apache NiFi, and it, it worked well. We, uh, but, we, but we had to scale it out quite a bit. We had to stand up pr four pretty beefy EC2 instances running Apache NiFi, and um, it, it did work. And it, it, and, but the problem with that approach was it uh, turned out to be a lot more costly to run those EC2 instances with the EBS storage backing it than it was just to use AWS Lam Lambda. And that was really compelling for us and, a, and a good primary reason we went with this approach, and we don't regret it. it, it it's worked really well for us. And the other thing as well, um, anytime you have a cluster anywhere, well, someone's got to maintain that and operate it and things like that. And that gets back to kind of what we talked about in the middle about how AWS is helping us collaborate, helping us focus on the mission and not uh, focus so much on all this infrastructure that we're having to maintain and continue to uh, work on. So this slide here is just to kind of talk about the, the vendor lock-in or lack thereof with the AWS, um, uh, with, the, with the Lambda function, it's just pure Java, um, and uh, we're using standard uh, Java libraries, a Apache HTTP components to download the image, we're using ImageMagick to convert and strip the images. There are a few API calls to Amazon services, of course, but they're not very intrusive. Um, so it's just, just plain Java. We use Maven as our build. You know, we use the uh, Shade plugin to, to create an Uber jar and, and deploy it out there, and that works well. Um, okay, so now we're back onto our roadmap about uh, image retrieval and classification. This is our collaboration part. So we've, we've got the images, they've been downloaded, um, the, they've been stored, the metadata has been stored, and uh, now this is the point where we, the research engages and uh, we move on to there. So um, on this slide here, this is what the researchers are doing. And to walk through this flow a little bit, they get a notification that there's a new image available. So they go out to Amazon, uh, to, to DynamoDB, they retrieve the metadata information about it, then they go out to Amazon S3, actually fetch the image, pass it on to TensorFlow Serving to do the categorization um, classification, and then that information gets brought back, and they persist that to um, Elasticsearch. We helped them set a lot of this up. We didn't just kind of say, hey, here's some tech and go knock yourself out. It was, it was really that collaborative effort working with these technologies. The Apache NiFi, we wrote a custom processor for them in NiFi to interact with the TensorFlow serving. Um, a little bit about the research. So that isn't, so we're not doing the research, so I, I can't at all speak authoritatively to this, but I can just tell you a little bit about what they're doing. They're do, doing deep learning. Uh, they're creating custom models, uh, and they're training them. Um, and that's why they're using the TensorFlow serving. This is running on Amazon uh, EC2 and GPU instances as well. Um, some of the custom models they're working on on the research side, one is a not safe for work uh, classifier, which you can imagine what that one does. And then the geo, a geo, an interesting one, a geo-inferencing one, so given an image, can you uh, determine what, perhaps what region of, of the world that, that photograph was taken in? So just a couple examples. And actually, that research there, they'll have a paper out probably by the end of the year. Um, Elasticsearch has, has been a great collaboration point for us as well. In this case, they're persisting that data to Elasticsearch, and they have a UI that they wrote that interfaces with Elasticsearch, so they're able to do the searching uh, on the image classifications using Elasticsearch, and then there's a service, it's not illustrated here, but uh, in front of Amazon S3, that they're able then to pull down the images and actually see them, and that also is a great collaboration point as well, for not just uh, for the individual researchers, but they can show that then the sponsors and uh, see that the, how the research is going and how those things are, are working. So a couple questions you may have on this, or one is, why did we do it this way, right? So if you're, if you're looking at this and, and you're following the flow, like, wow, that's a lot of work, right? Why don't you just dump it into S3 and then go and batch load it and then do your classification and do it that way? Why are you doing these notifications and all this other stuff? And this comes back to what we were talking about in the beginning about research at, at uh, PNNL, where 
we typically don't do research for research sake, but rather applied solutions need to come out of it. And this, and this is an example of this where we, what we have is a really a live streaming system where uh, our sponsor wants on-demand um, classification uh, in, of, of imagery coming in, and we're able to scale that out using AWS uh, quite well. And it's to the, uh, you know, this whole flow from the, from the time it takes to get a JSON message in, go fetch it from the internet, do all, do all the work that you're seeing here and have it land in uh, Elasticsearch um, can take under five seconds with the biggest bottlenecks being fetching it from the internet and then uh, the, the classification, right? And, that, and really the only bottleneck on the classification is how, how much money do you wanna spend on GPU instances? So, um, because the more you have, the, the faster it goes. So this is, it's an impressive flow and it runs at scale uh, and at scale, you know, meaning thousands of requests per second and it, um, it, it, it runs well. Um, trying to think here. All right. With that, you know, collaboration, researchers and engineers are happy. Um, we're able to collaborate with researchers and get them engaged early in the process. Um, it would have been much different if they had set up TensorFlow serving on somebody's desktop and then, or GPU rather, and, and then uh, they had, uh, uh, you know, had Python scripts run in and said, hey, we need to, you know, we need to scale this out and have it be streaming. Like, oh, okay, that's a lot of work. But in this case here, because we were able to engage with them uh, much earlier on, we already had that flow worked out. And, and by the time they were ready to uh, get more uh, towards a de de deployable solution, we were pretty well uh, set up for that. Um, these repeatable, you know, data, this is just an example of a data flow pattern, the repeatable data flow patterns. We take these tools and we mix and match them and we can do a lot of uh, different work with them to help enable that research. Um, it's really improved our collaboration and um, shorter time to deployments and uh, capability development. So with that, we uh, certainly don't work alone. There are dozens of us who are helping, that are working on these things and, and, and um, putting these things together, helping with the research. So just a few names out there, just. Uh, wanting to thank some folks, um, and thank you. Any questions? Yeah, we're not doing any type of, oh, oh sure, sure. She, she's asking how we scale out the NIFI, whether it's auto-scaling or if we do, that's how I'm interpreting, yeah, whether we're auto-scaling is manual. Um, so typically the flows that we get in are pretty constant, and so uh, there'll be some variations. So we, we, we're not currently doing any auto-scaling uh, with the NIFI instances. We scale it out based on what, we, what the average uh, volume of the flow will be. Um, but we've toyed around with the idea. I, I think we could. Um, you have to specify in the configuration files the IP addresses ahead of time, but if you, uh, it's possible. We're just not doing it. So it's a, it, it's, it actually is kind of one of the limitations or things that we've looked at maybe changing for certain parts of our flows. Is for that very reason is that you kind of have to do too much or more predictive understanding of your scale just simply to prevent that, just because you can't easily auto scale it or as easily as other things if you want to. So, and then one of the other current challenges that we have with it is that all the backing queues are really powerful, but they back locally. So that's one of the problems with it is if you have a node offline or a node goes down, you can't recover the data in that queue till it's back, back online. Now they're working on changing that, so backing it with something else like a Kafka or an HDFS or something like that. Uh, but right now the queue, the backing storage is local. So my point is that if, if you have flows running and you have like 10,000 messages in flight on an individual instance and that instance goes down, you can't recover those, those messages in flight until the machine's back online. So there's some scalability pieces of it that, that they're trying to work on. So, good question. Yeah, he's got it. No, the projects pay for it, so the contracts pay for it. As far as the VPC is concerned, so the way the lab is set up is that each project can have a separate um, AWS sub-account. We have a single master account, right? And then each project currently will get a sub-account. 
And then the VPCs uh, within those sub-accounts, it, it, it's really up to the project to how they want to set that up uh, and, and how they want to secure that with some oversight, of course, from the lab. But there are cases like this one where we have projects collaborate together so that, like, for example, other scientists that are on even other projects can have access to the images and things like yeah. that so that they can collaborate on the capabilities, right? It's a great question. We actually struggle with that one a little bit. And that's where the policies come in really handy, too, with IAM policies. Is to Mike's point about the collaboration, we can give folks access to the, to, to the resources and data they're interested in. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think in this case here, this is applied research. So the research, when it's done, will go live. And this will be a running system, and the, and the results will be, you know, maybe the development or initial research. That would be up to the individual researchers to decide how they wanted to persist that. If you're government, I think there is that possibility. Can he? So, sorry, sorry. Not, he was asking DNDO. Is that what you said? If they could use some of our services, um, that would be a conversation. I think with the lab, right? Yeah. Yeah. Get, let, let's exchange contact information. We can follow up on that. Right. We're, we're always looking for opportunity to do those kinds of things, um, which is another reason why we've been trying to push for the builds of these kinds of things so that we can have other people contribute and collaborate as part of the process, right? So, yeah, good question. Another question. Uh, so the question was, have the other 16 DOE labs made uh, the same amount or similar strides? I, I believe a lot of them are. I believe a lot of them are actually moving in the same direction as us, uh, and a lot, probably a lot for the same reasons, just simply that the physical environments are very limiting to them. And then also, you know, one of the key things that the labs want to do or be better about is collaborating amongst themselves, right? And not just even amongst themselves, but other for other collaborative reasons, right? Like when you're working through Power Grid or cyber or other things, right? And it's really difficult right now, just given like trying to even share data or content and all that, so yeah. So she was asking how we, we manage the, and you're talking about the flows, right, in, in AWS. So, so the flows and the management of the flows has actually been one of the other key challenges with them. So versioning the code behind the flows, so like our custom NARS or custom processors and all that is easy. You can use your normal Git flow. So we, we don't use a lot of the AWS tooling yet. We use Git and Jenkins and all that stuff, but then we do use like code deploy and stuff to push stuff out. But for the flows, the templates themselves, they're not nearly as easy to version control because they're really backed by some complex XML. Um, now, with that said, I know that uh, the creators or the folks that are developing NIFI have made a lot of strides in being able to do key replacements or item replacements within the templates themselves so that you could actually follow a similar pattern, right? So like, here's an example. It's one of the challenges we have with the flows is we don't make a lot of modifications between environments, right? Like you wouldn't be changing something in dev test prod, but the pointers or the properties for things like databases and queues and all that stuff, you would change. And that's actually somewhat of a painful process, or at least it was in the 1.2 version that we're using, but they're making changes there. So I guess to answer your question, we don't do a lot with that right now, but part of it is the template limitations themselves, the flow limitations. Oh, you, like, so she was asking how you can merge multiple endpoints. So there's funnels inside, or the concept of a funnel inside the NIFI flows, where you can attempt to join data together now, but it's not like, um, it's not like what you'd expect in terms of correlation. Now, that's again, I think, another feature that they've added that recently, where you can actually use a correlation ID or some equivalent to actually attach things together in the flow. So 
pull from two disparate sources and bring them together. So the funnel I was talking about is simply just funneling things together and adding priorities and all that stuff. The actual correlating of multiple content from very disparate sources, I think, is something that's either maybe there now or in the works. I haven't used it, though. Have, have you? I haven't, no. All right, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure if they've made that available yet, but I think it was at least on their roadmap. Yeah. Another question in the back. So the question, and hopefully I get it right, so the question was, have we put more thought into finding better ways externally to collaborate with even uh, entities even outside the, the lab system, right? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. So, so we have put a lot of thought in the types of things we build that would lead to that. A lot of the challenge that we have in being able to enable those kinds of things is just the physical environments and then the other items you brought up. We should absolutely talk because we would be open to suggestions there because we absolutely want to be part of that. It's a lot of the limitations we have are just things outside of our control. You know, like, okay, if you, if you want to create a collaborative environment under what funding and under what project and under yeah. what account, right, do you do that, that kind of stuff. It's not that we don't have, or other labs for that matter, don't have the tooling or solutions in place to do it. It's just finding the physical environments. And I think that's where we need to try to converge. And we do collaborate outside the lab in, in some cases, right? So it's not like that, that the, the infrastructure you saw, only PNNL uses that. That's not the case at all. We have external partners that are able to access those systems and we're able to use AWS, the IAM policies and whatnot to, to, to help configure that. Yeah, so, but true. it would be a conversation we'd want to have. He asked, "How long did it take to build the uh, that particular flow, and how long? How big was the what? The dev team. Oh, the dev team. So we have a dev team, uh, like pr probably on that flow, what, about three to five, somewhere in there, five maybe, uh, developers. And so that that flow actually didn't take that long because there's a bunch of hard work that went into before that, to learning to do that, right? To create that particular flow, right? And so what was you know we showed the data coming off Kafka." What's not being shown on there is, is how the data is coming into the system, and that re, you know is a big, de, a big dependency on where that data is coming from, how we need to bring it in and consume it, you know, and before it even ends up on Kafka. So, sorry not to be vague to your question, um, but I, I would say it took um, I don't know what three months maybe. Yeah, uh, the 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 most of the pipeline was trivial, right? Yeah, I mean, it, I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but it wasn't yeah. all that complex. Simply for what Ralph said, we've gone through a lot of pains in doing things wrong or picking the wrong tools or right or whatever. The part that's taken quite a while is trying to optimize the TensorFlow. Yes. And so, because one of the things that our, our, our researchers are trying to do is trying to build Docker images for the bundling of the TensorFlow serving pieces, because they don't want to use the out of the box stuff because then they can't write their custom models. That in addition to the custom models themselves. So really a lot of our challenges or their challenges was outside yeah. the basic pipelines. And then part of that is just our learning, the learning process for, from other things, and then just how easy some of the Amazon services are to use, right? I mean, they really are just attaching a knife fire and equivalent's not all that difficult. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, we, we know there's some really cool ways we could do a lot of that in, NIFI, uh, in, in AWS. Um, in our environment, we often, because we have to deploy solutions, we, there's cases where, where we're deploying and AWS is not available. So we use a lot of AWS services where we're able to, but we always have to be cognizant of where this is gonna end up and what technologies we're gonna have to end up using in that space. So just a quick note as well. And to Mike's point, the flow was really actually pretty quick to create. It's the, it's the TensorFlow serving, it's the Lambda function, iterating on that, making sure we're getting that right, and that was the hard part, right? So, yeah. yeah. All right, well, we're, uh... We're at time. I just want to really thank both of you so much for being so generous with your time and expertise. This was a deep but very practical session. So thank you so much for, for coming to be with us today. Yeah. Thank, no thank you. No problem. Thank you.